further ado. Thank you, Mike. Um, so thanks for turning up so early. But actually, Friday morning is a good slot for this. Uh, not for people in the school run, clearly. Um, but that will be all done and apparent. And um, so I um, want to start off a little bit. So most of you know me, I think, but I think there's a few people that I don't, I don't know. So I'm Jess, so I'm a dad. So I'm, you know, I'm a dad of one of some of the boys that come here. Uh, and um, I'm a biochemist, so that's what I studied in. Um, I, I love biochemistry. Um, and uh, I'm just rubbish in the laboratory, I'm a bit messy, so I couldn't do that as a career. And also as well, I didn't want to work in a laboratory because you can't talk to people very solitary in a laboratory, you know, it's kind of, I work in a creative industry, I work in an ad agency, we've got 1,850 creative people, so that's the environment I really, really enjoy. And then, um, and I'm sort of working um, uh, over the Omega at the moment, um, kind of doing advertising strategy and branding strategy, so that's what I'm helping some of the guys and girls here on. But for the last five years, I've been retraining myself in a professional environment, um, and um, I didn't give myself the title, um, but people call me now a behavioural economist, um, and it's taken five years to get there, and a lot of hard yards, all that curiosity, and a lot of early, early mornings and late nights. And um, but the title that I did give myself for this type of work is um, a choice architect. That's my title. I am a chief choice architect. I am the only chief choice architect in the world, um, and I have a team of choice architects. We have about twenty of them around the world, and basically it means I dabble in the magical arts of behavioural science. Um, and um, so I gave myself that title, um, but this is the nickname that people give me in the office, which is Yoda, and um, because apparently I can change people's behaviour with my Jedi-like mind tricks, uh, which I can, uh, and uh, not all of the time with everybody, um, but I can utilise essentially uh, an understanding of how you start to make decisions subconsciously and start to change your, your behaviour, not in a Machiavellian, duplicitous way, there's an ethical code that you can have to follow. To follow, um, and um, you know, it's, it's not as if I can hypnotise people, um, but I do in some motivates people. And you know, so it's a bit of a joke, but I think the joke is on me um, because I'm getting a bit older, but I'm not that bald. My ears aren't that hairy, um, but I think it's taking the mic out of my eyes. I'm only five foot five, so, you know, so I think the joke is on it is on me. Um, and um, but this is a literature. It's pretty good to get a show of hands. Who's read Predictive to be irrational? Has anybody read Predictive to be irrational? What about the notes? Came out two thousand nine. And what about thinking fast and slow? You might have heard see that's thinking fast and slow. Um, so this is kind of the literature that starts to break out around about 2008-2009. Um, uh, this is Professor Dan Airy from Duke, this is Professor Thaler from uh, Chicago, and Professor Kahneman was from Princeton. And um, so um, you might be familiar with, uh, with um, Barack Obama. So um, Professor Thaler advises Barack Obama and he advises David Cameron. So um, don't think that what I'm going to tell you is something that is a bit of fears, a bit of pop so sociology and psychology. The foremost Nobel Prize winners and academic leaders advising the most important people in the world with this type of stuff. And it's going to have massive implications and starting to. And it might come across um, as a bit of fun. Now, um, I'm just going to start off with this story, which is the $300 million button. Has anyone ever heard this story? Okay, now, um, this is essentially, I'm going to give you lots and lots of tools and, and, and things to think about, um, subconsciously and consciously. Um, but um, you've all been in workshops, and you know, John Gunn and Lowe, you've all been in workshops where kind of people can come up with ideas, and you want to come up with that idea that's going to make, make millions. Well, well, this is one where there was a workshop like this, and a team of people were working in a billion dollar e-retailer in the States. We thought it was Amazon, it's actually Best Buy. And this is what happened. Someone wrote on a post-it note, they wrote on a post-it note, I want to put a button on the website. Um, and they said, all right, okay, um, we'll put that button on the website. It costs $1,000 to put the button on the website, okay? That button is solely responsible for $300 million of incremental sales to Best Buy every year. That caused a dramatic effect. See what I did there? Um, and, uh, but what's quite interesting about that is you're thinking now about what does that button do? Right? It's a thousand dollar button on a website. It's driving three hundred million dollars worth of sales. You're also thinking, why couldn't have I thought of that button? And can we put one of those buttons on the Holton website? And that's what you're kind of thinking at the moment. And this is the button, and I'll walk you through how it generates all those sales. That when you go onto Best Buy um, or any other website that you're buying stuff, you put stuff in your shopping cart, and you have to essentially, if you're not being cookied, you have to sign in. 
and you have to put your email address and your password. Now imagine for some of you, if you go onto those websites and if you can't remember your password, it's a bit hard to remember, you might bail the car because you're going to do something else. And um, so that was what's happening, people were bailing the car. Or if you've not signed up to that website, you might have to create a profile. So you have to go in and type in Jens, Blum, and Cheshire Boys, and all that sort of stuff. And if you can't be bothered to do that, you'll bail the car. So this is what they did, they put this button on it, and it says check out without the profile. I don't want to create a profile, that's okay, you can always create one later. And what happens is, people go, I've just filled up my shopping cart, I don't want to do that, but I will check out with that profile. Mm. And then what they then do is they then fill in their credit card details, and then they fill in their address, because they have to get this thing mailed. And then you get asked, do you want to complete your profile? 90% of people then go on to complete the profile, even the said they want to check out without a profile. <laughs> And this is kind of the, the, the small things in the human psyche. And these two present massive uh, cognitive loads, because not, not huge, um, but um, for the primal brain, the brain, they create barriers. You know, this feels like more effort, this feels like more effort, whereas this feels very effortless. So these are kind of small changes um, in essentially path dependency, choice architecture, our experiences that we have make big, big differences, and it requires just small changes in things can have massive, effect, massive effects. So I've worked in the ad agency for 25 years in that business. We talked about big ideas, and then now I just talk about little ideas, the big, small nudges, um, really, 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 really tiny things make huge differences. And if you get these right, they can have brilliant. Uh, uh, consequences. Sometimes if you get them wrong, um, uh, they can have quite catastrophic consequences in terms of uh, human psyche. So um, I've kind of got um, a team of people I work with. Rory is uh, my co-founder. He's a brilliant speaker. He does um, TED. So if Rory can't do a talk, I normally do it. I'm his number, number two, if you like, in terms of those profile things. He's rubbish at doing the work. He's just a really good talker, so I do the work. Um, and um, I work with a lot of academics, um, and I work with big clients, and I generate quite a lot of um, response uh, increases for commercial and social good. Um, I've hired some people. Um, this is Dan sitting down. Um, so Dan, obviously, uh, my hiring policy is only hiring people shorter than me. That's the deal. So you've got to be shorter than five foot five. This is with uh, Peter Johnson, who is a uh, professor of psychology at York. And this is a really nice. This is Professor. Uh, uh, Thompson's actual um, psychological fascination, which is, you might be looking at this thinking this is Photoshop, um, and, but if you look at this a bit harder, you can see that actually Dan's sitting in the corner of the room. <coughs> this bottom of the chair is actually pulled forward slightly, it's called a Boucher's chair. And what your brain does is to make sense of it, it essentially makes Dan tiny. So, so quite a lot of these kind of psychological, uh, I suppose, illusions start to maybe play with your mind a, a little bit. And I've got a team of psychologists, um, choice architects. I've got so Dan's a psychologist, Peter's a human geographist, Rebecca is an anthropologist, Jules is a psychologist, behavioural science master, Kiza is a psychologist, social cognition master. So I've got a team of really, really bright creatives and I work with a lot of uh, academics in this area. And I work with some big businesses, so you'd be familiar with those, those kind of names. Um, I also work um, with um, those Nobel Prize winners. So this is Professor Kahneman, this is Rory, this is Nick, I introduced it up here. This is Cialdini, so he wrote some pretty good stuff. Um, Principles of Persuasion, um, and Steve Martin, um, and then this is Nassim Taleb, he wrote a pretty book called Fooled by Randomness, which is all about, essentially, the financial markets. And if you want to know more, then we're, as a, we're an ad agency, so we've just got everything you ever want. We've got SlideShare, YouTube, LinkedIn, all of that Twitter, all of that type of stuff. I also um, went around the world um, creating the world's leading behavioural science practice, so this is where I went last year, um, making all of these things happen. So, when I get to this point, right, I normally look around the room and I've got, I think, two believers. So James is a believer, Mike's a believer, but everyone else is going, I'm not so sure about this, okay? Because um, I don't think small things can have a big effect. So, what I just want you to do, if you've got pens or paper, some of you've got pads and stuff, so I've got some pens, who's not got a pad or stuff like that? So what I'm going to do is we're going to do a bit of a quiz. This is why I like it on a Friday. Um, and um, I'm going to ask you some questions. And you've got to answer these questions. Okay? Um, and um, write down your answers. Um, and um, Mike has said this is going to go forward for your talent management or pass on to your employers. Well, you'll see your personal development as well. So um, that will all go through. 
And um, so what I'm going to do is ask these questions and um, to make it a bit more fun. Uh, make it a bit more fun. Uh, what I'm going to do is um, we've got prizes. And um, so uh, we've got some prizes, some books. Okay. So if anyone gets over there's eight questions, anyone gets over six out of eight, then you get a book. Okay, if you don't, then you don't get a book. Okay, and um, I'll go through it quite quick, just for, for time. Write down your answer, and then we'll just, you can mark it by themselves at the end. So I'll start with the first one, quite an easy one. Bat and the ball uh, cost a dollar ten cents in total. <laughs> the bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So bat and the ball, a dollar ten cents. Bat costs a dollar more than the ball. Uh, how much does the ball cost? Write down your answer. Quick. Question two. Got two squares here, a square marked A and a square marked B. Which is the lightest square? Is it the A square or the B square? Okay, quite easy, just A or B. Three, some of you might have seen this before, um, but if you know the answer, write it down, don't share it out. How many F's are in this sentence? Finished files are the result of years of scientific study combined with the experience of years. So how many F's are in this sentence? Finished files are the result of years of scientific study combined with the experience of years. So write down your answer. Question four. If it takes five machines five minutes to make five widgets, how long would it take a hundred machines to make a hundred widgets? So that's five machines, five minutes to make five widgets. How long would it take a hundred machines to make a hundred widgets? Okay, get to the end now. Um, we've got a big rectangle and a thin rectangle. On the thin rectangle, which is the lighter side, the A side or the B side? Write down A or B. Question six. In a lake, there is a patch of lily pads. Every day the patch doubles in size. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire lake, how long would it take for the patch to cover half the lake? So that's 48 days and half the lake. Get to the end now. Uh, question seven. Which is larger? This length of the table on the left or that width of the table on the right? Is it the one on the left or is it the one on the right? And this is the final question. I'm just going to show you a film. Um, I don't know who's seen this film. Okay. Okay, since, okay, so if you've seen the film, just keep the answer to yourself. You've got to count the number of passes that the team of white make. You've got to really follow the ball, because the basketball team is throwing the ball around quite fast. Okay. You've just got to count the number of passes, okay? And hopefully the sound will come on. We tested it before, but let's go. So. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Can you write down your answer? Your answer. <laughs> okay, so you can mark your own, okay? Excuse the answer. Ten cents, give yourself a tick. Question two was B, that was the chessboard, that was a lighter one. Question four. Uh, three, it was three, some people get four or five, three is a common answer. Question four was 100 minutes, that was the widgets. Question five was A, that was that left hand side. 24 days. Question seven was the table on the left, was a bit bigger. Question eight was 13, some people get 11 or 12, right. Now I've done this quiz most probably over 100 times with lots of different audiences. No one gets eight out of eight. Does everyone get eight out of eight? Okay, they want to get seven out of eight. Okay, seven out of eight. Okay, so you get a book. Well done, seven out of eight. And we get six out of eight. Oh, I'm trying to, you're doing well. Six out of eight, so six out of eight, book for you, book for you. Okay, this is where it gets just as I said six, didn't I? Okay, so you've got five out of eight. Oh, that's a man, you know. Um, you can give a four out of eight. Okay, about three out of eight. Three out of eight. Two out of eight. One out of eight. Hold on, one, no, zero. And we get zero. See, it's interesting, this quiz, because People who got zero would have done the best because all of these answers are wrong. <laughs> all of these answers are wrong. Okay? Got one. Got one. That's good. So Ireland did the best because all of these answers are wrong. Now, I've done this quiz a lot, um, and um, the interesting thing isn't the fact that you got them wrong. The interesting thing is that actually the way the questions frame and the speed that we do and the way that I frame the questions means that I knew that on average people get four, five, or six of these right. And actually, they get them all wrong. So don't worry about the fact that you got them right or right or wrong. Everyone kind of does that. I did it with Martin Sorrell, okay? And it was just the three questions. Martin Sorrell got three out of three right, and I had to tell him, you know, essentially, this world leader that he got three of these questions wrong, which is quite fun. <laughs> really good fun. And um, so, 
What I want to do now is just go through each question a bit slower um, and just work it through. So who put 10 cents for the first one? Okay, 10 cents. Yeah, did anybody put anything different? What did you put, Alan? Five. Five, yeah, you. Have you seen the question before? No. Did you spend a bit of time on this one and not yeah, the questions yeah. two, three, four, five, six? Yeah, that's often what we've got. Because this one, this one, this one is the breakthrough behavioural economics question. It's one of my favourites. That's why it's question number one. Which is that the way the question is framed, you jump to a conclusion that this ball is 10 cents, okay? But it can't be 10 cents because, look, if this is 10 cents and this bat is a dollar more than that, then that would be a dollar 10 cents. So when you add them both together, you get 10 cents plus a dollar 10 cents, we get you a dollar 20. So it can't be 10 cents. That makes sense? Now you look at it. So it's 5 cents plus a dollar 5 cents, and you get a dollar 10. And honestly, that's a brilliant question. Um, I've done it with finals yeah. people, actuaries, people that are really good at maths. Often, often people get it right, often like Alan, they don't actually answer questions 2 to 8. They spend all of the quiz doing that question, that's why I always qualify it. Or they send the question before and they just won't admit it. So, um, so it's quite interesting. And the reason why is because your brain sees it and just jumps to a conclusion. Now this one is um, that these, th that A square is exactly the same colour as the B square. It's exactly the same shade of grey, right? They look different to you. Now I'm colour blind. I have a deficiency in my rods and cones, okay? Um, and due to genetics on, on the Y chromosome. And then, um, but they look different to me, okay? And I've done this, right? And they look different to you now, don't they? They look different. A and B are different. Okay, watch this. So I've covered this up. And they look different still. Cover them up there. And as they start to cover the outsides up, you can start to see that actually they're the same shade of grey. And I go back, and you can start to see if I go back, that they look different. And this essentially is your brain's overriding what your eyes are seeing. Your brain is trying to make, make sense of it. Look, I'll go back again. And this is kind of really freaky. Now what happens is people often say when it gets to this point all you're doing is changing the shading of grey. Now watch this illusion. It's exactly the same thing. So you look at this and you go look, that A square, the A square is, is grey and the B, the B square is white. Now this will really freak you out a little bit. Okay? So I promise some of you this will be life changing. Some of this might freak you out. Hold your finger like this. Okay? And close one eye. And bring this finger back until it essentially covers up this middle bit about there. Oh. And you'll see that that's the same shade of grey top and bottom. Jesus. Now take your finger away. You see that they're different. Put your finger up. Oh, Quite cool. And this essentially is your brain overriding your visual acuity system to make sense of what's going in the world and jump into a conclusion. Now this one, um, most people put three or four. Um, did anybody get six? Keep it to yourself. So you guys got three. So you would have seen this before. Okay, who got three? This is quite cool. Who got three? Okay, three. So you guys got three. Henry get four. Three, three, okay. Now this is what happens. The people get three. Get this one. That F, that F, and that F. Finished files and scientific. Okay? Now this is what really weird. The people got six. Well, I know it's good. They got of, of, and of. So there's six Fs in the sentence. And they were there all the time. You know, they, they just couldn't, you couldn't see, you couldn't see them. And often when we're kind of looking at um, this type of, I suppose this is kind of more about uh, phonetics um, and about how our brains process things. I mean, um, you're really good English speakers, um, most of you I think. I mean, I'm from the north, so I don't speak English that well. And, um, but when I do this in around the world, they see the S straight away because they're not fluent English speakers. But because you become fluent in the language, you actually don't necessarily need to see the uh, the of to make sense of the sentence. But actually, some work they do. We actually can see that we see words rather than letters when we become accomplished readers, and you can jumble up the letters, and people can still read the sentences. But also as well, when I ask you to look for Fs, your brain starts looking for Fs. But of isn't an F sound, so the 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 of. Um, and then, this is kind of another illusion, which again, one of my favourites, called the McGurk effect, about how essentially your brain can override sometimes your visual acuity system, or your visual acuity system can override other parts um, in your auditory system. At any one moment, we are being bombarded by sensory information. Our brains do a remarkable job of making sense of it all. It seems easy enough to separate the sounds we hear from the sights we see. But there is one illusion 
that reveals this isn't always the case. Have a look at this. What do you hear? But look what happens when we change the picture. And yet, the sound hasn't changed. In every clip, you are only ever hearing bar with a B. It's an illusion known as the McGurk effect. Take another look. Concentrate first on the right of the screen. Now to the left of the screen. The illusion occurs because what you are seeing clashes with what you are hearing. In the illusion, um, what we see overrides what we hear. So um, the mouth movements we see as we look at a face can actually influence what we believe we're hearing. If we close our eyes, we actually hear the sound as it is. If we open our eyes, we actually see how the mouth movements can influence what we're hearing. Ba, ba, ba. It's a bizarre ba, effect. Ba, ba. Remember, the only sound... That one freaks people out a little bit, the McGurk effect. And, in, and this, this is the start of processing that we're beginning to understand. When we get to the part of it, people know, they know something's up, they know there's some trick questions going on, people often know the answer um, isn't 100, so they go, well, it's not 100, I'm being led to be 100. They sometimes put 20, okay, so if you put 20, it's a bit better than 100, it's going to divide by 5. And, and, uh, but the answer is 5 minutes, and the, what, the reason why is because essentially it doesn't matter how many machines you've got, because each machine is producing one widget, it takes 5 minutes. You could have a million machines producing a million widgets, it would only take 5 minutes because one machine produces one widget. I presented this to the IBM guys, and the IBM guys going, yeah, but what if these machines talk to each other? And like, well, that's, that's, that's IBMers for you, yeah, yeah. This one I don't think is as good as the chessboard, but when I look at this, this looks light grey, and it gets to about there, it starts to get darker, and it goes to this, and that is definitely darker than that left-hand side. And um, when you start to cover it up, it's the same block of grey. And these relativity frames about how we make decisions um, about a lot of things actually, prices, um, how we are in terms of how we feel about maybe our weight and our looks, that we're always judging things based on what's around the thing that we're interested in as much as the thing itself. Now this one, um, did anybody get 47 days on this one? Okay, well done, are you a nuclear physicist? <laughs> radioactive half-life decay. Remember when you were at school and you did radioactive half-life decay? Remember that one at school? Yeah, 47 days. I was a bit naughty on it because I said so that's 48 days and half the time, so you must really put 24. Um, but if you think about it, it's doubling in size every day, it would have been the day before that it was half the size and then it doubled up to get to, to essentially the 48. This one is Dan Ariely's favourite. Um, essentially, you've got two tables, and we're well, hardwired to think that these things. Um, yes! Uh, yeah, well done, James. <laughs> now, this one I think is really cool. So. Um, for those people who have seen it before, it's quite a, big, quite a bit of fun, but um, I think um, there was 13 passes, some people get 11 or 12, but I want you to really, really focus on it this time and really count the number of passes, okay? This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? <laughs> Mine did the same time. She was one of my friends in, in an ad agency that I worked in 2009. It was a famous psychological experiment called around it, inattentional blindness. And like, you're all really clever. Like, you're all really, really clever. But the part of your brain that does quite a lot of some of the processing that you do can only deal with a finite amount of information. Um, and actually, it's kind of deal, you can deal with like, kind of like dialogue broadband. 
remember those old days? That rrr, rrr, it feels quite slow and clunky. And actually, by showing you, that's you to focus on a simple task, which is just counting the number of these classes, it means that you can't focus on, on other things. Now, for those people that seem to be more compared, this is what we really like. So I'm just going to play a bit of a card trick. So I'm going to turn some cards over. You've got to pick a card, just remember the card, and then I'll turn them over again. So, okay, pick a card, remember your card, okay? Remember it, it's in your head. Okay, I'm going to turn them over, okay? Now what I'm going to do is going to move them around. And all of these cards will move around like this and spin. There's, they won't jump over each other. There's a little bit of a jump in the film, and, uh, but you've got to follow your card, okay? So follow, they move quite quick, okay? So what do you do? Follow... Hello. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a card away, okay? And then I want you to put your hands up if your card isn't there, okay? Put your hands up if your card isn't there. Put your hands up if your card isn't there. Okay, good. You all chose the same card, right? Different set of cards. Different set of cards on the different second, set. Cards in the second set. Yeah. So inattentional blindness, and um, essentially a lot of this kind of like overloading the part of your brain which you think you do a lot of thinking is something that magicians do quite a lot. Um, so essentially, they occupy uh, that part of, uh, of your brain with distraction. You know, so they start to say something over here, and your brain focuses on that, and something is going on uh, over here. So the psychology and the physiology around it. So, like I said, I'm a biochemist, um, and um, so I was fascinated by DNA and, and RNA, transcript RNA, about a lot around genetics and the physiology of this sort of stuff. I'm fascinated by. It. And um, so this is the human brain, um, so I don't know if you're familiar with it, I'm sure some of you are, are very familiar with it. And, um, but for those of you who aren't maybe familiar with kind of um, essentially the, the construct of it, you can see here you've got the spinal cord coming up. And you can see here you've got kind of a small brain kind of in there. Um, and um, this is the primal brain, um, and it's the often referred to as the reptilian brain. So when you look at evolution, um, this part of the brain exists. Um, with uh, quite a lot of um, our sort of family, but our distant family um, in reptiles. And, um, and here you've got the amygdala and you've got the hippocampus uh, within there. And uh, it's been there for millions of years. Um, and it's often referred to as the automatic or the emotional brain. So that's where a lot of our emotional uh, sits and a lot of that processing. And then the mammalian brain, actually, uh, which doesn't exist in reptiles and is actually smaller than a lot of other mammals, you've got the prefrontal cortex here. Um, and um, very prevalent um, in, in the mammalian brain. And um, so this is referred to as system one, um, and, and in terms of the way that the dual operating theory two theory was evolved in 1984. Um, and this is system two. So we've got kind of two bits of our brains doing sli two slightly different things. When I was asking you those questions, I was asking this part of your brain. Okay. When Alan asked, answered the first question, we utilizing that part of his brain. And um, so these kind of processes have been there for a long, long time um, and um, have been codified over millions of years um, around some quite sophisticated constructs. And this is kind of an experiment done with capuchin monkeys. There's actually a whole area of work about how we make decisions um, in life done um, in an island. And um, it's called monkeynomics. And they look to see how monkeys behave to try and understand how we ourselves behave because a lot of our decision-making processes are actually... Uh, you've been essentially good by a, a long time ago. So this is an experiment done. It goes on for a while, but it's got quite a nice payoff. And um, I'll let the guy explain. So the final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, the, the, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with Capuccio Monkey. And I'm, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, birds and the chimpanzees, uh, Ms. but Ms. Sarah Blossom started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the part the grapes, the two preferences of my which of these cars pop exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes as a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. 
recently we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grapes, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task, and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does, and she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> And uh, I'll come back to that. 
But often you kind of go out and have a look at some houses, and you have a look at five houses, something like that, flats, whatever, and you fall in love with, with flat three, okay? And you go and look at flat four, or house four or five, and you go out. Now, because it's a big financial decision, you have to do a spreadsheet, because it's a big financial decision, so you do a spreadsheet. So what you do is you get all the variables, you go, how close is it to work, how many bedrooms does it have, how much work does it need, and all that sort of stuff. And you score it all independently, okay? And you think you did the right thing. And then it comes up with house number five. And you're like, hmm, I don't really want house five, I want house number three. And then you go back to the spreadsheet and you start kidding yourself, going, maybe it's a bit close to work, right? <laughs> right. And actually, it doesn't require much work. Um, and often that's kind of a, pr sub pr pr a subconscious processing decision making, you fall in love with that. Actually, there's something going on which is a paid to introspection. You don't know why you like that house so much. It just feels like a good thing for you to go, go and do. And essentially, your emotions drive your decision making uh, a process and more conscious and, and reflective. So, these are pretty big decisions. You know, I, I don't know if, if anyone's ever fallen in love, okay? If you've ever fallen in love, I really hope you use that part of your brain, okay? So, you didn't sit at the date with your spreadsheet and say, right, I'm going to score you now. Right? So, how much fun are you? Right. <laughs> you know, how many children are we going to have if we want children? You know, how much money are you going to earn? Because I want to, you know, I'm hopefully you didn't do that. Now I've done this talk a lot. Apparently there are some women that do have a scorecard. So guys, they do have a scorecard. Like they come back after the day and they have ten things that they score score the guys at. So what's really interesting from this is kind of from the winning and the sporting perspective. And this is where I get fascinated because you know I really buy into the child's proposition, which is about understanding kind of. Um, different types of inputs and stimulus to try and help us understand these things. But um, the 10,000 hours was kind of celebrated in Malcolm Gladwell's um, uh, work. And you know, um, there's a lot of kind of, not controversy, but there's a little bit of challenge to some, some of that type of thinking. But essentially, this is kind of the operating system um, for how we codify kind of sporting movements o over time. Because you know, this is kind of, again, my again, mess some people up, but the primary function of your brain is to tell your body to move. That's all it does. It tells your eyes to move. It tells your body to move. That's all it does. It's only just recently, you know, literally a thousand of years, that it's become a reflective thinking tool. Its primary function, essentially, is to get you to move. Okay? It just tells your body to move uh, in some form um, or other. So what happens is that when you're learning a new skill, Essentially, it utilises this reflective part of your brain. So when you learnt to drive, this is what you did. You found it really, really hard and you got it wrong a lot. And then you got to a level of safety and a level of proficiency where it actually made it safe for you to go on the road with other people. And then you continue to learn, such that when you drive now, you, you drive with this part of your brain predominantly. So I don't know if you've ever found this, that you guys all come to Holton and they lot, okay? But there might be some days where you're not due at Holton. But because you're thinking about that meeting, you might get in the car and you'll be driving along thinking about your meeting and it's not at Holton, but you find yourself driving to Holton. And you go, oh, Christ, right? You, you know, it just, it, honestly, it happened. Yeah. And, and, and uh, so and the reason is, is because essentially your reflective part of your brain can process uh, um, stuff and you can be thinking about stuff while this part of your brain subconsciously is driving you around. So, um, and this is kind of how we go by sport and movement. So, um, when we start to become proficient in something, it becomes an automatic, very you know, muscle memory, um, and a very instinctive or intuitive response. And it's really, really important because we have to deal with things that are coming at us really, really, really fast. Um, so I, I read some work which was looking around the speed of things and how, since how we catch a ball. So imagine if, I mean, if I said to you, how do you catch a ball? Okay. Um, what are the mental processes that you go to catch, catch a ball? Um, do you do this? Um, with a control that would look just over, right, the velocity of that ball is coming through with the speed of X meters per second, the weight of that ball. You don't, this is what you do, is the automatic part of your brain says, if I move towards the ball, keeping my angle of gaze constant, then I'm going to catch that ball. So if you think of when a ball's thrown, you just go like this, and if your head's facing the same way, then chances are that you're going to catch the ball, okay? Assuming you've got some relatively soft hands. It's actually slightly inefficient because you run at a slight, slight curve. And that's kind of the mental shortcut that we've developed to try and cope uh, with this uh, world. Now, when you get to top level athletes um, and performance players, um, they often talk about um, choking and people think overthinking things. And that's essentially when you start to engage the, different, the wrong part of your brain. And um, I was reading a book by Go Giger and uh, literally last night about, um, about how people can utilize this within sport. Um, and, um, 
and there was some a German versus Argentinian World Cup game, um, and it was Lensman, I think, the, the German goalkeeper. Okay, when it came to the penalties versus Argentina, what he did is before he got there, he got a piece of paper out, and he was looking at the piece of paper, and he was looking at the numbers of players, and went, right, okay. And then he gets rid of this, okay. And then another player comes up, and he goes, uh, okay, comes up, right? And, and Germany win, okay? They win on the penalty count, because the Argentinian players come up, and rather than thinking about where they're going to place the shot, they're thinking about, and then knows I'm going to place the spot, and they start to overthink it, and they choke the shots. Now, the interesting thing is when Lennon was asked what he had on a piece of paper, he had exactly that. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Again, there was no record. It was usually like a psychological bit of game and shit to try and get them to overthink stuff. And um, so that's kind of, um, kind of more around the, the system one, system two, and how we codify. This one I really, really like. It's a bit, a bit of fun which is going back to the kind of cognitive overload and how we can overload. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to ask you to read out what, what words say, and we'll go through them quite quick, so it's like blue, green, yellow, okay? Well, this one's quite easy, so um, you all got a shout out, and I'll point to them as you go, so. Blue, green, yellow, pink, red, orange, green, black, purple, tan, white, red. Well done, that's good, okay? Now, we're going to do it again, but I want you to do something different. You've got to say, essentially, the colour of the word, Okay? So it's the colour of the word. Okay, you with me? Okay? We'll go through it, okay? Red, blue, red, blue, green, purple, red, blue, red, blue, green, purple, red. <laughs> <laughs> tough, tough. And the reason is, is because essentially, when we get to this, you get dissonance between system one and system two. Because essentially, your Homer Simpson is saying, say the word, and your Captain Spock is saying, no override it, you've got to say the colour of the word. So you get into this distance and your brain gets tired pretty quickly. So that's why we've developed these very, very quick and efficient processes. Because essentially, Homer Simpson is infinity broadband, times a thousand. Whereas Captain Spock essentially is a dial of processing. So actually, you are really clever, but you might not necessarily um, be utilising the brain that you think you were using it in the first place. And uh, So this has been developed, this is the type of work that I'm doing, which is um, how you get use this for good, and how you use it to save money, and get people to think about things in a different way. So this is um, a male urinal. It's the most efficient toilet in the world. It's the most efficient toilet in the world. Okay? It's in Schiphol Airport um, in Amsterdam. It exists to have been there. So ladies, this is a male urinal. This is a male urinal, right? It's in an airport, right? So it's really important it's in an airport. So when men are in airports, they're normally one of two things, or both, right? They're really bored, okay? Or they're really drunk, right? Or they're both, they're bored and drunk. So when they go for a wee, this is what they do, okay? They wee there, or they wee there, or they wee there, because they're drunk and bored, they just wee on the floor, and it's disgusting for men. Like, but honestly, that's what men, men do. And um, all they did is they thought about how they might get men to wee in the toilet when they're drunk and bored. And you could put some posters up and talk to Captain Spock, saying, men of Shipple Airport, please do not wee on the floor. Because if you don't wee on the floor, we can save you, save, use all the money that we pay on the cleaners, give you free Wi-Fi, and you know, Sky Sports, you know, stream through to your phone for free. And, and that talks to Captain Spock. So they didn't do that. Essentially, they wrote some software for System 1. They thought, how can we get Home Simpson to wee in the toilet? So this is what they did. Is that little dot there um, is a little fly that they etched onto the toilet. So these men come in, and they come in drunk and bored, and they go, and then they see the fly, and then they aim at the fly. And then what happens is Homer Simpson gets quite, quite pleased with himself, because he hits the fly. Okay? Now, I think when he hits the fly, what it is, he gets a feedback loop. And that feedback loop is kind of it's an affective feedback loop, because you're hitting it, so you're a reward. Okay? And, then, and then you start to see if you can actually keep that up, so you compete with yourself to see through the stream of your E, you can still hit the fly. When I say competitive, I don't mean this guy's like, <laughs> like, 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 it's not that competitive, like, I don't do that. But they went, well, now, it's, it's essentially the, kind of a seminal nudge, it's a piece of what we call software for Homer Simpson, and that saves them hundreds of thousands of euros on operational cost for the airport, okay? It doesn't cost anything, okay? You can buy these stickers now, um, and we have them in our, in our toilets. So, um, this is some stuff done by The Economist. Um, which is about getting used to buy subscriptions for The Economist. So this is TheEconomist.com. You can buy The Economist.com subscription for $59. That's the website, $59. Okay. Or you can buy the magazine print subscription for $125. Okay, so that's the magazine. Now that makes sense because it's a magazine that costs more because there's paper involved. And then you've got a third option, 
which is the print and the magazine, the magazine and the website, print and web, which is $125. Now, when you look at this, this is what Homer Simpson thinks. If I buy that, okay, it's going to cost more. Hang on a minute, this one is $125, and I get that and get that for free. That's what your brain's just done. And that's what happens. That essentially, when you put in, say, symmetric relative frame, most people buy this one. Okay? When you take this option out, most people buy that one. Okay? So you put these three in, most people buy that one. You take this one out, people go, actually, that's quite expensive, we're going to buy that one. Now, the interesting thing about this is that they put this in there as a dummy option. They don't want you to buy that. They want you to look at that and say, actually, I'm going to buy that one because they get that for free. Okay? And this is economist.com. So I don't know, these are our world leaders of finance that are essentially being nudged by this, by a very, very simple asymmetric frame in decision making. And this is kind of the stuff that, um, you know, it's kind of some ethical codes um, around it. The view on this would be that everything in there um, is transparent. There's no, there's a psychological nudge within there. Um, and, um, but this is kind of the debate for that. This is more in the physical space. I don't know if you've seen this one, which is about getting people to be more active. This is Piano Stairs, it's done by two creatives who work at Ogilvy now, and they did really work in DDB Stockholm. This is getting people to walk upstairs. If you go to a big building, what do you see when you walk in? You see the reception. What's, what do you see here? Lifts. Lifts. Okay? And where are all the stairs? Okay? At the back, as the fire escape, with no overlook. It's just terrible. And actually, if we redesign our environment to actually keep us fit and healthy, walking up, looking outside some beautiful vistas, I think it could be a way to keep us healthy. Now, um, I don't know if anyone else has got a speeding offence recently, but I did. Um, this might be quite helpful to reduce, uh, reduce my speeding offence. I did the course on that. Hi, I'm Kevin uh, Rickett, and I'm now. the winner of Volkswagen's Fun Theory Awards. My idea was the speed camera lottery. Can we get to the uh, Vegas speed limit for fun? I really believe that fun can change human behaviour for the better, and I was really thrilled to see that my idea, which started as a scribble submitted into this competition, uh, might even become reality. Thank 
camera lottery would do two things. One, it would photograph the uh, speeders, give them a uh, citation, uh, and that money goes to the pot. But if you're obeying the law, your picture will also get snapped, and you'll be entered into the lottery and win some of that money from the speeders. <laughs> So that's why the government is a lot, of, a lot of the government, so we've got a nudge unit in the UK, um, there's a nudge unit in Australia, there's a good spin that's going to be one in the States. So essentially, if we write software and design an environment that talks to our home Simpson brain, at very, very low cost, we can actually start to uh, save quite a lot of money, um, which we can utilise for, for better resources um, and, and um, for better progression. So, um, so we've been doing some work in this area. Some of our work is kind of pro-social, some of it is more commercial. I won't show all of it, I'm just conscious of time, but I'll show you this one film, which was um, seemed quite a long time ago, but I remember the London riots. I mean, I was on holiday at the time, and, um, and uh, you know, I, I was a little bit dislocated from it. But it was quite visceral, it was quite strange, and we didn't really understand it, that that could happen in, in our country. And what happened was we went um, into the area of Woolwich and the areas affected by the riots, and we created something that reduced antisocial uh, behaviour on an ongoing basis in those areas. Um, and we did it a very, very low cost way, but a very psychological way. And we wrote some, some software that talked to Homer Simpson brains to reduce antisocial behaviour. As the London riots of 2008 were cold, people in Greenwich burned down the pub they drank in and looted the shops where they bought their food. But as the disturbances died down elsewhere, Antisocial behaviour in the area continued. Greenwich Council needed to find a way to stop the problem minority from destroying their own community. We believed that the shop shutters that were ripped from their runners were part of the problem. Could we turn the shutters into part of the solution? We wanted to conduct a social experiment. In 2009, a team of scientists from Pennsylvania found proof that the large head, round face and big eyes so beloved of Disney actually motivates caring behaviour in adults. They proved that cute matters to the brain. If I was in local government, I know it would be a lot easier to say, I'm getting more police out there, than to say, I'm painting a few shutters. But I think we need to work to build confidence that these kind of interventions have their role, that they work and they have their role, and get them taken seriously as hold interventions which are expensive and in the past are proven not to work. Could the power of cute minimise antisocial behaviour in Greenwich? After a campaign to recruit babies from the local area and a long night painting, we turned the unused and inhuman metal sheets into giant portraits of Greenwich babies. As the shots shut at night, the metal shutters came down to reveal the babies when they were needed most. It had a powerful effect on community, with an 18% reduction in crime, and locals who say they feel much safer. If you've got positive images around, it makes you think positively. They are amazing! I think there should be more of it. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. And it didn't take thousands of pounds or hundreds of police. Just a few cans of paint. The people of Greenwich have shown an overwhelming love for the babies, and the shopkeepers have embraced the idea as their own. Before long, other communities all around the world, from Belfast to the Bronx, were talking about it too. What started as an experiment in London is now being rolled out in Northern Ireland this year. This could be the dawn of a new era in crime prevention. So that was kind of a piece of work we did with um, some young creative psychologists in, in the team. And um, you know, it's that type of stuff where you start to really sort of see how, by understanding how people make decisions, how you can affect people's behaviour and apply psychology um, for good, you can start to make you know, some real impact in the world at a very, very low cost. Um, there's some stuff which um, I think I'll share um, most probably with Nick and Julia, I think, which is about how you triple sales of drinks in bars. Um, and um, so I'll show you that film um, at another time. But we did some work with uh, Nestle and Perrier Waters, and we got Parisians essentially to um, 
I've drank twice as much Perrier, which is quite a challenge in Paris. Um, and, um, and it was done at absolutely no cost. We just did some small changes in the, in the environment. Um, and now we've got a triple uh, sales in London. Um, this is some work we did um, in the area of well-being and about how you make people happier. Now, the reason how you make people happier is quite a, a simple thing. You pay them more, don't you? Like you pay people more. Okay, that's often the ways that people think that money's going to buy happiness. It doesn't. Gives you a short-term spike in happiness. What's really interesting is this is how money makes you happier if you get paid more than your friends, <sighs> which is really sad. Some people, there is a psychological study, and some people, well, quite a lot of people, they feel happier earning a less uh, relative amount, um, but more than their friends. So they could earn less overall, but as long as they were earning more than their friends, they would be happier as a result. Which again is kind of, we often judge things uh, relatively. So we did some experiments with Coca-Cola about how you make people happier. I think the behavioural scientists are at their happiest when they're out in the field conducting experiments. So what would be better than conducting an experiment on how to make people happier? Using a behavioural principle called the Facial Feedback Hypothesis and a 3D printer, we created the Happiness Bottle Top, an attachment that makes you smile when you drink. Some pedopsychologists have proved that simply smiling more can make your brain become happier. To test whether these special bottle tops could have this effect, we hosted two coat picnics. One had the happiness bottle tops, and the other didn't. When brain happiness levels were tested, <coughs> the experimental group were 25% happier than before the picnic, while the control group were only 3% happier. So, it seems smiles can make you happy. So, that, that was the piece of work we did. So, that was essentially the happiness bottle top. Um, so, that sits um, on a Coca-Cola bottle. And, um, again, it creates an ethical debate. So, that's not great for red coke. You know, for Coke Life and, and Diet Coke, we felt it was, it was appropriate, even better for waters. But this is essentially an area called body cognition, which again, you, you talk about in terms of the way that the players perform about getting their bodies in the right uh, um, shapes to affect their psychology. And essentially what this does, you know, you drink it, you smile, and it tells you, your brain, that you're happy. And I think the way that a lot of people think that they live their lives is under free will, and essentially this is how you think you live your life. You're walking around and your brain is telling you what to do. It's like saying, yes, walk over there, smile at Mike, look over there, wave around. And actually what's happening is that you're walking along, and yet yeah, your, your eyes and your ears are taking in all of that stimulus, but talking to your subconscious, okay? And subconsciously you're making those decisions, okay? You're walking, walking along, and then actually it's then telling your brain, your subconscious brain, what, what that should feel like. So it's kind of like, imagine that if you had a threat come towards you, you go, what's, what's that threat? Is it going to hit me? No, you don't. You just move out of the way really quickly. Okay, so it's the fight or flight, and obviously we get that the physio physiology keep kicking in. But what's really interesting is that you often think that you see something, your brain tells your body that you're scared, and then you go away, and that's not what happens. You see something, you move away, and then your conscious brain reflects on that and says the reason I moved away is because I was scared in that order. So there's some quite nice language, which is a bit freaky, which is again, this gets quite philosophical, is that you think you operate under, essentially, um, uh, an environment of free will, that your, your, essentially your conscious brain is in control of your agency. And there's a nice piece of language that says, actually you operate in, in an environment of free will, that your body is moving around doing stuff, okay? And actually, it's only your brain that kicks in to say that that's maybe not a good idea in, in the first place. So quite a lot of that chimp paradox is exactly that. that. Essentially, your body is often, and your brain, subconscious brain, is making these decisions for you. You move into these areas, and sometimes you keep them in check. More and more often than not, you don't. So being aware of these things is quite important. And um, just to make sure I kind of wrap up um, quickly would be, I did say um, there was three things I was going to tell you. How you get your bosses to pay you more, um, which I'm sure everyone got their pens right. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, how do you get your bosses to pay you more? Be more attractive. Okay, it's a real challenge for me. I'm five foot five and quite average looking. Okay, if you have qualities that your primal brain feels are um, essentially um, motivating, so it might be uh, height, it might be um, physique, it might be eye colour, it might be hair colour, your bosses will pay you more, twelve percent more on average, just because you're attractive, and that's painful. That's really poor. Essentially, you might have some two people with exactly the same skill set, exactly the same level of performance, 
but because this one has got qualities which your Homer Simpson brain finds particularly appealing, you pay them more. Okay, so we're doing a lot of work in diversity and inclusivity about how our subconscious makes some quite poor decisions. So, um, you know, you might have um, a subconscious bias that doesn't like overweight people, okay, and all obese people. If it, but if you're employing them to do a job which might be call centre based um, and their productivity and, and performance is better than other people, you might choose other people just because of, of that bias that you have. So, um, so the answer is be plastic surgery, I think. I'm not saying go that, but um, but just these sort of things are quite quite enlightening in terms of kind of how you make decisions. How you should exercise in the morning more. So we need to tell John because he was on court at six o'clock this morning. I think John. Yeah. 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 Quarter two. Um, quarter two. Um, and um, how do you exercise more in the morning? Um, and this is obviously not for you guys. You've got some strong defaults that other people are going to be there maybe, um, and it's your job. But some people find it quite hard to, to motivate themselves. Um, this, and you could, I suppose, you get a Google app or a, an iPhone app and a bit of wearable tech and use that for that. But this is um, a really, really easy way. Is you put your trainers at the side of your bed. And when you wake up, you follow your trainers and they're there. Okay? Um, and because they're there, you're more likely to go ahead with that decision than not. And this is the final one, um, which is how you get teenagers off their iPads, which is quite hard. And this is how I do it with my boys. It doesn't work all of the time, but I say to them, I say, Louie, what time are you coming off your iPad? And you'll say, mm -hmm. I'll go, say to me, I will come off my iPad at 8 o'clock. And he goes, mm -hmm. no, say it out loud to me. And he goes, I will come off my iPad at 8 o'clock. Now, he doesn't come off it at 8 o'clock every night, but the chances are that he's made that mental commitment and he's made it public out loud means that he's more likely to follow in that course um, of action. So, you know, you find yourself doing this within business. When you want some form of confirmation, you often ask people to write things down for you. Um, and uh, this has saved £700 million pounds in the NHS um, by getting people essentially to commit to coming to appointments. Um, so, it's a, no, it's a £700 million pound problem and it's solved £31.8 million pounds of that problem so far. Because I say to you, so Mike, can you say to me that you're coming to your appointment at, uh, at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning? Yeah, I'll be there at 10 o'clock. Restaurants do it all the time. That's why they're in you to confirm, so they don't get the no-shows. So they keep their profitability going. And um, you're more likely to follow through with that because your home symptom has essentially codified that in. So I'm just going to ask you four questions, okay? You've got to shout out loud. This is a bit of fun and then I'll let you go. Um, well, there's a, bit, there's a bit of stuff at the end which is specifically for you, which I think is quite cute. But you've got to shout out the answers to this. Um, and, um, and we'll see where we go. So you've all got to join in. So the really easy, really easy questions. Okay. So what? What's the colour of snow? White. White. What's the colour of a doctor's coat? White. What's the colour of this cloud? White. What's the colour of this t-shirt? White. What do cows drink? Milk. See, that's interesting. <laughs> Because cows don't drink milk. <laughs> cows, you see, cows drink water, right? And then they produce milk. And it's interesting that, yeah, after you spent, I don't know, an hour and a half learning a little bit about behavioural science and about some of the things we've already known, but actually, when you prime people with certain certain things, um, it can get Homer Simpson to jump to conclusions. And I've, I've talked to you, you know, that that's what happens. The interesting thing is that now you know this, um, and um, there's kind of some people kind of go, oh, that's great, because now I won't use Homer Simpson. I'll just use Captain Spock for all my decisions. The unfortunate thing is, when Professor Kahneman asked, you know, can you keep them in check, is with the knowledge that you've now got, it doesn't mean that all of your subconscious processing goes away. You can be, just become more aware of it and sometimes reflect on it, but you can't stop it. It just happens in milliseconds, and you jump to a conclusion, which essentially helps you cope with the life of a prehistoric caveman. You know, you're making some big decisions about pensions that are essentially based on should I avoid that snake or, or not. Um, and it's quite quite crazy in, 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 a, lot, in a lot of respects. Um, this is one specific view. It's one that I came across fairly recently. If you've seen this, then, uh, then, uh, uh, then don't shout out. But this is quite interesting, which is, um, look at this, there's a picture here. And, um, and, and the question is, do you say anything remarkable? Okay. Now, when you look at this, um, I don't know, I often look at this, I'm, I struggle with this a little bit. Is it clouds? Is it might be um, uh, maybe some land mass and some sea and like a blurry photo? Um, and you kind of go, do you recognise, is it Manhattan or something like that? I don't know. Um, and um, it's just really cool because, you know, you can't necessarily see anything if you've not seen it before. Certainly, most people can't. 
But then watch this. This is really, really good for curiosity, specifically curious cows. Okay, here's the cow. Okay, here's the picture. Here's the cow's head. Can you see the cow there? Now, I'm imagining when I showed you that first time, you couldn't see a cow. Okay? Now, what's really, really interesting is if I go back, you can see the cow. Yeah. And forever when you see this picture, you'll see the cow now, because your brain has essentially seen the pattern, identified it, and can jump to the conclusion that that's the cow. So, um, it's really, really funny. When we do the quiz at the beginning, like, Jim, you know, we didn't get a book, did you? Well, right, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Who else did you get a book? So it's really funny when you do it, is um, those people that got books, most probably, are feeling quite pleased with themselves. <laughs> um, and, um, and those people that didn't have them um, are feeling quite down about it. And, um, but the, the, reason is, the reason why we kind of do it is that um, all I did is, if you go to number 19, in the book. This is 20, 29 decision making processes. Yes. Go to 19, right? Scarcity value, wanting what we can't have. People value things more highly when they believe that they are scarce. And that's something that comes from the savannah as a caveman, that essentially if something needs scarce, scarce resource, it becomes more valuable. And you get those pulls all the time. So these things are really important. So me and Nick are doing a bit of work on the Health and Fitness Club. Just saying that actually it's limited to 450 members is incredibly motivating. It's very, very counterintuitive to some people, but actually to a lot of people that comes with a lot of benefits because this has got some, some limited um, resources. So um, and the reason why um, I say they're worth £25 each um, is because price is a heuristic of quality. It's a mental shortcut. If I said they were free in marketing material, you wouldn't treat them as any value at all. If I say they're worth £25, we have spent a lot of time, we've read years of, of psychological literature and to get to this point. But when I say they're free to you today, that's another psychological shortcut that makes you feel uh, slightly good about it. So that's kind of the work I've been doing for the last five, uh, five years um, and um, at Overby. And um, there's some beautiful um, butterflies. Um, really important. Um, Primacy and recency in a customer experience. So first impressions really count, but last ones do. Whenever we do a fee proposal, we put a nice little picture of an animal at the end of it, um, usually a little elephant, um, so people think better of us, um, and we feel good at the end of our fee proposal. And um, that's really done, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've got 10 minutes, I think, if anyone's got any questions or is anyone has everyone not been psychologically freaked out or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> broken? I have a lady at Black Rock Insurance, she was really freaked out because she thought she operated under a captured spot mentality and she did, really didn't like to be told that her brain worked like Homer Simpson. The interesting thing about Homer Simpson, I think, is um, uh, that um, it's, it's kind of a metaphor. Your, your, essentially your primal brain has been codified in such a way that it's just brilliant. It's just a brilliant decision making system. It's just sometimes it jumps to the conclusions and often the wrong conclusions. And if we can understand that and utilise that for good, then we can redesign our world to essentially to make it better. So there's other odd models, like another model is an elephant and a rider. So essentially is that um, the elephant um, is, is moving along and then you've got um, the rider or, uh, which is directing uh, the elephant and if the elephant wants to go in a certain direction uh, then it will do and that's the primal brain so if it's really hungry and wants to go for food it's going to go for food right and even if Captain Spock's saying don't, don't go for food you've already eaten that day you can't have a ride uh, the ride can't have a ride the elephant so if you're a bit worried about thinking you're Homer Simpson or Marge Simpson uh, then, uh, then maybe the elephant and the rider are the better model uh, my favourite Homer Simpson jump to conclusion is quote I think is um, Marge Marge get me the number for nine one one, which for me is kind of that's often how we do things. We kind of you know it seems very quick, but often maybe not fully reflective and consciously thought out, um, and, um, and which is really really important, especially in sport, um, because if we utilise the wrong parts of our brain to do some of the things, um, then it's just going to take too long. 
I'm going to overthink it, I'm going to choke. Um, and it's about understanding the relationship between the two and actually how we take a lot of learning in system two and start to process and codify it such that it becomes so fast and second nature. Um, and um, I mean, I'm fascinated. I was, I was talking a little bit, I mean, I don't play tennis at all, but I did play a, a lot of rugby. And uh, there's a rugby league player called Jared Hayne, I don't know if you're familiar with him, from the NRL in Australia. He's just started to play American football. And he had the best pre-season run-up, really, really build up, okay? He's a running back, he's a sort of full-back in rugby, but he's a running back. And I was chatting with one of the guys uh, who I worked with, who's a Welsh under-19s uh, rugby union player. Anyway, so this punt goes up for Jared Hayne to catch his first touch of professional American football. The ball goes up, right? Everybody's watching. And he goes up to catch it, and he's done it lots and lots of times. He goes up to catch the ball. And then just as it the boy, and he dropped the ball of the ball on his first touch. And we were reflecting a little bit from a psychological point of view. And to say that, yeah, what I think what, the reason why he most probably didn't catch the ball, it's hypothesis, is that he spent his 10,000, which would be 20,000 hours, understanding essentially the movement of the ball through the air and how that looks with a ball that's slightly bigger. So when actually he's gone down to a slightly smaller ball, the actually the arc of the ball has most probably just come at a slightly small, minimal bit, bit of difference, but essentially it's gone like this. His arms, okay, should be a bit like this, they should have been a bit more like that. But because he was under pressure, he reverted to his sort of system, system one, which essentially was a slightly bigger ball moving at a slightly different pace, and, and let's see what happens. So the relationship with sport um, is a fundamental one in this, um, and it's still quite... You know, system one and system two. Um, it's a very simple oper a view of the operating model of the brain, right? Um, so um, a lot of the brain and neuro guys are laughed at by the cardiologists. You can see a cardiologist say, "How does the heart work?" They'll give you a pretty good description. If you go to a neuroscientist and say, "How does the brain work?" Like, I don't know. Do some this and these things like it's up in the brain. We don't really know yet. So there's a lot more work to do um, in the same. Yes, you mentioned your own colour blindness, and yes. uh, I share that, so that coloured words yes. thing was being probably good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but do you see any correlation between sort of behavioural differences between, for the want of a better word, mainstream population and, say, people on the autism spectrum or dyslexia spectrum or anything like that that changes things? Or um, So, um, yeah, yes, yes and no. Um, so I don't know if there's anything, um, I've not seen any specific papers or read any specific papers in that area, um, but I'll just go to another common misconception which I really like, which is clever people okay, actually utilise Captain Spock a lot more and they don't use any of that Daptoma Simpson stuff. Um, and there's a paper out that says that actually people with higher IQ are more likely to use system one processing so I imagine those high-performing um, people on the spectrum in certain areas are most probably so finely attuned on the, on the system one thinking. Um, and, um, and so I can only imagine that's the case. And um, so that's the first thing that don't think if you're really, really clever that you don't use Homer Simpson, you actually most probably use it more. So that's one paper. As I all these things, there's another view, which is that there are some people um, Another paper says it's the opposite, that if you're highly IQ, you actually you can be more reflective and conscious and less reliant on the number of shortcuts you use. But then this is the real killer, that you do use some shortcuts, but you're, if you've got a higher IQ, you're not aware that you're using them, which is really, really cool. I just think, as for us on a tennis court, as coaches, there's just massive implications around decision making and how we program or how athletes program themselves. You know, there was <coughs> an interesting article that I alluded to earlier in the week on the Inner Times about the rugby, about this like, you know, playing on instinct. Yeah. You actually they're not making the decisions, it's all in the subconscious. Yeah. Because everything is in front of them. Yeah. And then those 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 actions are just taken and and how we work in the decision making area with tennis players. Yeah. It's, um, really interesting. Yeah, the thing for me is, um, so with the knowledge of what I know now, I um, essentially trust my system one when system one is the right decision making process, but when I think it's maybe not the right, I'll reflect on system two. So I remember um, when I, 
because some of the finished files is from um, Clive Woods winning, and they use quite a lot of visual acuity coaches and psychology on pitch. Um, and I think what he had was he had his team performing instinctively, but at certain points they would then jump out of system one, go into system two and go, right, I'm on the pitch, I'm in this part of the pitch, where am I on the pitch? And then they'd then start to engage back into system one. And I think that's the way it should be. So when you're driving, please don't drive around utilising captain spot because it's tiring. Um, just drive, and this, it'll freak you out a little bit because when you're driving, you will find yourself driving along utilising Homer Simpson. But you just got to check in sometimes with captain spot, look at the speedometer, you know, and that's kind of just understanding you've got these two decision-making processes. There's one thing where anyone with small children is supposed to kind of be maybe going to mind. This is like, this is like, makes you feel really bad as a parent. Um, but when you're reading your children's books at night, okay, and this is where it gets really, I mean, it, may, it may, may feel a little bit bad about myself, you can read your children's books while thinking about something else. So you can be reading it out loud and la 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 <laughs> you're thinking about what you're doing. And for me that's when system one and system two really made me feel bad because I wasn't essentially uh, consciously engaged with this book. I was just, just blah 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 ring what this thing would be, but I was thinking about maybe we've got on the presentation then. <laughs> no, actually that's not fair on the time. Um, and then the, the final thing I think would be, I mentioned a little bit, would be um, this is maybe just a nice warm up warm <coughs> We get, often get asked is, um, how can you utilise this psychology to make you happier um, and well, increase your well-being? Um, and all of the psychological uh, sort of data banks suggest this, that there's two things that can make you happy. Um, the first one is attend to the moment, okay? So don't be distracted by phones. Just a, if you're with people, attend to those, to those people. Um, and the second thing is, um, don't think that buying a bigger house um, that might be further away or a car is going to make you happier. It makes you happy for a little bit. The thing that makes you happier is spending more time with the people that you love. That's the answer. Mm -hmm. um, and attend to that happiness when you're in that moment. Mm -hmm. So spend some more time with your family and your friends and when you're with your family and friends, don't be on your phone. And that will make you happier. That's just a very simple piece of advice, but um, that seems to be the winning strategy for more of the psychologists who are being coached. So I will leave you on that note. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Thank you so much. So just a big 